Something about Christmas gives us the illusion of safety and comfort. But the reality is that even when you're surrounded by friends, family, and gifts, tragedy can strike at any moment, and Christmas can be anything but merry. Kaylee Elise joins me for this special edition of Twisted Tens. December 1996 was a rough time for 32-year-old Patty Vaughn and her estranged husband, J.R. Vaughn, who had been going through a trial separation since October. The couple still lived together in Lavernia, Texas with their three children, but on Christmas Day, a fight erupted when J.R. learned that Patty was dating again. She left the house and never returned. The next day, police found Patty's abandoned Dodge Caravan 15 miles away with flat tires and traces of blood inside. Also inside was a worker's jumpsuit with the initials JM on the back. That very same day, JR filed the divorce papers, leaving Patty's family to file the missing persons report. At the time of her disappearance, JR was working construction on a school, and authorities thought it was possible he'd hidden her remains in the concrete foundation, but with no evidence to tie JR to any crime, he was never charged. He gained custody of the children and moved the family to Colorado shortly after. Later, authorities discovered not all of the blood in the van was Patty's, but all of it was female, putting forth a new theory, that J.R. might have had an accomplice. J.R. has maintained his innocence throughout the entire ordeal, but had Patty declared legally dead in 2005. In 2008, authorities announced they were following a lead and believed several family friends conspired to help JR dispose of the body, but still, no arrests have been made. On a rural farm just outside of Seneca, Illinois, John Larson spent Christmas Eve in 1885 drinking whiskey with his employers, a married elderly couple named Patrick and Matilda Rooney. John only downed a couple drinks before retreating to the guest bedroom upstairs, but upon waking on Christmas morning, he discovered a nightmare. Patrick was dead in his bed on the first floor, and Matilda was nowhere to be seen. But there was a large, gaping, charred hole in the kitchen floor. Next to the hole was a calcined portion of a skull, part of a spine, a foot, and a pile of ashes. This was all that was left of Matilda Rooney. It is believed Matilda spontaneously combusted in a fire that reached 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, torching her body into ashes, but also not damaging any of the surrounding furniture or home. Patrick perished from smoke inhalation, and John only survived because his room was on the second floor and he slept with the door shut. There was no evidence to suggest foul play, and some believed Matilda caught fire due to the amount of alcohol in her system, and family members saw it as divine retribution for being drunk on Christmas Eve. With so little evidence, we may never know the exact cause behind Matilda's sudden, fiery death. 19-year-old Rhonda Hinson was on the path to success. She'd recently graduated high school and was settling into her new job at a local steel company in Hickory, North Carolina. On December 22, 1981, Rhonda and two of her friends attended a company Christmas party, but by the end of the night, things were anything but festive. Around 1 a.m., less than a mile from her house, Rhonda was killed when a bullet from a high-powered rifle tore through the trunk of her car and straight into her heart. When police arrived on scene, Rhonda's body was several feet away from her car, but the medical examiners determined with her injuries it was nearly impossible she dragged herself that far. Witnesses that night saw two men in a blue Chevy along the same road, and later, a man was seen standing next to Rhonda's driver's side door. The leads turned up nothing, but police did learn of Rhonda's strange behavior in the days leading up to her death. Her parents said she'd become unusually reserved, and offhandedly commented about the troubles of dating a married man. She told her father she needed to confess something, but never revealed what it was. The unspoken secret haunted Rhonda's parents, and even to this day, it is unknown whether or not her death was a tragic accident or a well-calculated murder. 
but her family did their best to commemorate Rhonda as they'd known her, inscribing, always a ray of sunshine on her grave marker. After Christmas Eve in 1988, Anthony Michalowski disappeared. At first, his family wasn't concerned as Anthony had a history of going dark for long stretches of time. The unemployed 22-year-old didn't turn up again until December 27th, five days later. Only this time, he reappeared in pieces. Anthony's severed head, along with a lung, several of his teeth, and his lower jaw and tongue were found in trash bags scattered in various city dumpsters. While only 15% of his body was recovered, the Allegheny County coroner determined Anthony had enough sedatives in his system to induce a coma, depending on his tolerance, and he had been dismembered post-mortem. But no cause of death could be definitively determined. The case went cold until 1992, when the body parts of a prostitute named Michael Hickmott turned up in an eerily similar fashion. Both victims were unemployed, disemboweled, dismembered, and scattered in varying trash bins. Police zeroed in on a 38-year-old self-proclaimed neo-Nazi vampire named Robert Marshall. Robert was connected to Michael's death, but before he could be arrested and questioned, he committed suicide. Robert left behind a note, but he did not confess to any crimes. However, authorities suspected Robert could have been a serial killer and that Michael and Anthony were only two of his victims. Anthony's case has since gone cold. Though cemetery workers at Pleasant Valley Memorial Park in Annandale, Virginia, were accustomed to being surrounded by the dead, they weren't expecting to find one above ground. On December 18, 1996, they came across a woman lying atop a plastic sheet with a plastic bag taped over her head, deceased from asphyxiation. Authorities found no ID, but they did find a suicide note that read, Deceased by my own hand. Prefer no autopsy. Signed, Jane Doe. The only clues to her identity were her belongings, a knapsack with a roll of masking tape inside, jewelry, alcohol and juice bottles, several comedy cassette tapes with a player, and an eight-inch decorated Christmas tree sitting next to her body. Despite airing the information on local media outlets, no one came forward to identify the woman. Many find it curious that Jane Doe chose to take her own life in the part of the cemetery where deceased infants were buried. The investigating bodies were particularly perplexed and saddened that the woman wasn't recognized. They felt she likely had family or friends who were missing her for Christmas. The reason behind her suicide and her desire to remain anonymous are still unknown, and she remains a Jane Doe. On Christmas Eve in 1973, 20-year-old college student Kevin Showalter and his girlfriend were driving through New London, Connecticut when they got a flat tire. Kevin braved the cold and hopped out to change the tire when he was killed in a hit and run by a passing vehicle. When Kevin's mother, Lucille Showalter, went to pick up Kevin's personal belongings, she was told they were gone and that Kevin's death would likely never be solved. Four years later, Kevin's case was assigned to Judge Joseph Dennehy, who determined the driver of the vehicle was likely the former mayor of New London, Harvey Malove who was in the area and gave contradictory testimonies of the accident. Still, he couldn't be connected to the scene, likely due to the faulty police work. Then in 1979, a man named Paul Henson claimed he was responsible for the hit and run, but there was no evidence to prove his involvement. In 2005, Paul killed himself, and in his suicide note, he again insisted that he'd killed Kevin. The authorities reopened the case, but realized that a 3,000-page document from the original grand jury investigation on Harvey Malove had disappeared. Harvey has always maintained his innocence and even hired a private detective to assist with the investigation, though Kevin's mother pursued justice for her son until her dying day. His homicide remains unsolved. When Jarrett Betterson lost his girlfriend, Susan Klingel, in a tragic car accident on September of 1977, he became a single father to their two-year-old daughter, Nicole. Not long after, Jarrett began dating a woman named Barbara, and around Christmas time, they announced their plans to move from Dearborn, Michigan, out to the West Coast. 
but no one would hear from Jarrett, Barbara, or Nicole for over two decades. In 1997, the Klingel family hired a private detective to locate Nicole, but there was no trace of her since 1977. Yet Jarrett, who was residing in Las Vegas with Barbara, still collected a monthly check for Nicole's social security benefits for children with deceased parents. Before authorities got the chance to investigate further, Jarrett and Barbara took their lives in a double suicide. Before their deaths, Barbara mailed a letter to the Klingel family that read, by the time you get this, we should be dead. Jarrett is about to go to jail, and I don't want to live without him. I'm sorry about living apart from our family. I'm sorry about so many things. We've had a sad and difficult life. There was no mention of Nicole's fate. While many hope that Nicole is still alive and possibly unaware of her own identity, authorities believe it is more likely she is deceased and buried in a hidden location. Though if Nicole is still out there today, she would be 41 years old. In 1945, in the quiet town of Fayetteville, West Virginia, nine of the Sauter children and their parents, George and Jenny Sauter, were enjoying Christmas Eve in the warmth of their rural home. Full of energy and eager for Christmas morning, the children begged to stay up late, but by midnight everyone drifted off to sleep and the house fell silent. Around 1.30 a.m., Jenny groggily woke to smoke and fire consuming the house. She and George, along with four of their children, all escaped the house unscathed. George frantically called to the remaining five children on the second floor, but heard no response and couldn't get to them as flames engulfed the stairs. By the time the volunteer fire department arrived on Christmas morning, the house was destroyed, but investigators found no sign of 14-year-old Maurice, 12-year-old Martha, 9-year-old Louis, 8-year-old Jenny, or 5-year-old Betty in the charred rubble. The night of the fire, witnesses saw two men stealing George's hauling equipment and throwing what looked like fireballs onto the roof. The men admitted they'd cut the Sauter's phone lines, but neither were investigated further concerning the fire or the five missing children. The case was closed, leaving the Sauter family devastated. They believed their children were kidnapped and that the house fire was merely a cover-up. There were several reported sightings of the children after the fire in surrounding areas, but none of these claims held up. Twenty years after the fire, George and Jenny Sauter received a mysterious picture that resembled their missing son, Louis, but the sender couldn't be located. The grieving parents erected a billboard offering a $10,000 reward for any information that might reunite them with their children. Unfortunately, both Jenny and George Sauter passed away before finding out the truth. With theories ranging from an abduction by the local mafia to a botched investigation, it seems we may never know what happened to the Sauter children. In 1994, Tracy Mertens, a 31-year-old mother of two, had recently moved to Rochdale, England with her boyfriend, Joey Cavanaugh. On December 23rd, she traveled to her old apartment to gather her remaining belongings and wasn't there but 10 minutes when a knock sounded at the door. Suddenly, two men in leather caps and long coats rushed inside, shouting and demanding to know where Joey was. Tracy, who knew her children were with Joey, said nothing. Angered, the men blindfolded and restrained Tracy before dropping her off on the steps of a church dousing her in gasoline and setting her on fire. Tracy was rushed to the hospital where doctors determined she had burns on 90% of her body and they could do nothing to save her. She told authorities what had happened to her before succumbing to her horrific injuries on Christmas Eve. Police uncovered Joey's heroin addiction and found out he owed several people money at the time of Tracy's death. Still, he insisted he didn't know who was behind the murder. Tracy's children now reside with their grandmother, Barbara, and the family says Christmas was too painful to celebrate in 1994. Even now, decades later, this time of year brings anything but cheer when remembering Tracy's awful fate and knowing her killers are still at large.
Recent divorcee Latricia White and her boyfriend Lee Dub Wackerhagen had a rocky relationship. Latricia, a mother of two who worked as a nurse, lived with Lee in their McMahon, Texas apartment, where Lee's nine-year-old son Chance was often the center of tumultuous fighting. But the family enjoyed a nice dinner at a restaurant on December 26th, not knowing it would be their last. The next day, Latricia missed her shift at the hospital, and her father entered her apartment to check on her, only to find her dead from six gunshot wounds to the head. The house was untouched, and nothing was missing except for Lee and Chance Wackerhagen. Immediately, police suspected Lee murdered Latricia in one of his jealous, drunken rages and kidnapped Chance. Three days later, his pickup truck was found in a field 30 miles away. Inside, police found Lee's wallet, checkbook, an unfired hunting rifle, and in the back, a pile of Christmas presents, some unopened and streaked with blood. There was no sign of Chance or Lee, and the blood didn't belong to Latricia and couldn't be identified. Authorities were forced to consider the possibility that Lee and Chance might have fallen victim to Latricia's killer as well. Months later, Chance's grandfather answered a phone call to the voice of a young boy saying, help me, before the line went dead. But most of the family believes that call was a prank. Since then, authorities have reopened the case, citing new evidence suggesting Lee and Chance were victims and in danger if not already dead. While some maintain the theory that Lee took Chance into hiding after killing Latricia, police now consider Lee and Chance missing persons. That's all for this episode. Now be sure to head over to Kaylee's channel where she dives deeper into the haunting mystery of the Latricia White case. You can press on screen or the link in the description below and don't forget to subscribe to her channel while you're there and I'll see you next time.